social and political commentary in horror filmmaking is as old as horror filmmaking itself. Whether it's the Cold War, Civil Rights, Watergate, Vietnam, Reaganism, the Iraq War, or terrorism, America has used the horror genre to look inward at itself, and the last decade in horror filmmaking is no exception. Blessed be our new founding fathers and America, a nation reborn. In 2013, James DeMonaco wrote and directed a low-budget home invasion film called The Purge, set in a dystopian near future where, for one night per year, murder and other crimes were legal. This is your emergency broadcast system announcing the commencement of the annual purge sanctioned by the US government. This cult, pulpy film contained plenty of silly B-movie thrills, but it also attempted to provide a biting social satire about class and race in America. We are some fine, young, very educated guys and gals, ready to violate, annihilate, and cleanse our souls. A decade later, after several politically tumultuous years in America, writer-director Beth Diarajo made a single-take home invasion movie called Soft and Quiet. Emily's life matters, so does mine. All lives matter. The film also looked at racism and economic tension in America, but in a far more brutal and unflinching way. Stop moving! Stop it! While these two films couldn't feel more different in their tone and execution, both movies convey a sense of fear, terror, and pure rage about the state of modern America. Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of home invasion and we discuss James DeMonaco's The Purge and Beth Diarajo's Soft and Quiet. Welcome back to the evolution of horror. My name is Mike Munzer, and as ever, I am your host. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre, one subgenre at a time. We are currently in the middle of our ninth season, exploring the evolution of home invasion horror, and this is part 26. In this episode, as that intro suggested, we are going to be looking at The Purge from 2013 and Soft and Quiet from 2022. Both of these discussions will be spoilerific, but I will issue a brief trigger warning about Soft and Quiet before I recommend everyone check it out. Soft and Quiet is probably one of the most extreme movies that we're covering on this home invasion season. Uh, it is a very upsetting, disturbing movie that contains extreme racial uh, hateful language and assault, violence, torture, and even some sexual violence as well. So uh, just wanted to make everyone very aware of that before we get into this week's discussion. So joining me to discuss these two very different movies. Uh, I've got two very good longtime friends of mine and friends of the pod. They were last here in our vampire series discussing Blade 2 and Kronos with me. I'm very excited to have them back. Matt and James from Journey Through Sci-Fi. Hello! Hi, Hi Mike! Mike. Get as high pitched as There's we can! There's so many syllables that I just go up and up and up and up! <laughs> How are things? James, how's Journey Through Sci-Fi? You guys have had a little summer break, right? Yes, we've had a little hiatus um, and that's still carrying on for the time being, but we uh, are coming back into the main series shortly. I think uh, next month we're going to start kicking things off again with our space opera series, which we are halfway through at the moment. Amazing. Matt, how are you finding space operas so far? Oh, I'm absolutely loving it, Mike. They are so much fun. They're, such, they're <laughs> yeah. so lighthearted. After this recording, I can't wait to go back and watch some nice, fun, refreshing, lighthearted <laughs> uh, uh, films for, for our podcast. I know. I'm, I I thank you both for being here and doing this. And apologies. <laughs> I mean, you guys were talking about your because obviously one of the films we're about to talk about tonight, you guys have covered already on your dystopian season, right? And I remember you yeah. guys talking about by the time you got to the end of that season, like you were kind of done with the kind of bleak, <laughs> horrible subject matter. So thanks for coming back to it. I really appreciate it. Um, and speaking of bleak, uh, we are covering home invasion movies this series, obviously. Let me start off by asking you or your thoughts 
thoughts on this subgenre. Matt, for so many people, it's one of their least favorite, most triggering subgenres of horror. How do you feel about it? Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't particularly <laughs> like it. I sort of love hate it. It's one. It's the genre I really love hate the most. I think um, you can you can go ahead and add my name to that list. I they they really upset me. Or or in particular, it's the one that like gets in my head. Right and keeps me up and literally keeps me up at night like I can't I I cannot go to bed without having checked I've locked both doors and occasionally I'll go to bed and realize that I haven't done one of them and then I'll lie in bed for five to ten minutes being like I don't need to check that I've locked it (laughs) and eventually I get up and I lock it and that's because of home invasion stuff I'm just terrified that someone's going to break in and like murder me in my bed um and it just you know the horror movies I love are like zombie films that are just really fun and not too serious and i know it will never happen to me whereas home invasion films just like make me grab my fucking seat and like (laughs) get really tense and then just live inside my head afterwards they are incredibly stressful aren't they james what about you what do you think of home invasion films i don't have too much of an issue with them but (laughs) i mean these films i mean one in particular that we watched i definitely had issues with just in terms of getting through it yeah but i mean just in general i think home invasion stuff i don't know i haven't had any sort of well touch words and thank god i've never had any sort of real life experiences of anything like Mm. that and it just seems it's it's something which i get more freaked out by the really supernatural unexplained stuff for some reason you're much yeah you're much more freaked out aren't you when 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 you watch like a ghost movie or a demonic possession movie or something (laughs) i think i've got an overactive imagination which just works for (laughs) really fantastical non-plausible stuff and then anything that could actually happen and it happened in real life then it just doesn't scare me for some bizarre reason i'm living in a fantasy world Mike. no i like it i think that's a good way to that's a good way to be do you have a plan in your head matt have you ever thought about it about like what would you do do you actually keep like a baseball bat under your bed or anything like that like have you thought about what you might do uh, yeah i used to i used to have like a not a baseball bat but like a like a rounders bat or something yeah. like that. probably <laughs> yeah. like crack over someone's head and break if i ever had to use it but yeah. um my wife made me get rid of it when we moved <laughs> house because she was like this is ridiculous <laughs> why have you got this what are you gonna do with this oh have you ever have you ever had anything like that happen to you before i mean all of us have lived in london and places like that right where it is it can be quite commonplace Mm. to get broken into or burgled right matt have you ever had anything like that happen to you i've had stuff we've had stuff smashed up and broken but no one's ever like come into my home yeah that would be awful but yeah we you know we've had we've had incidents and stuff like that in the past and i will just caveat that there though i've got rid of the rounders bat after recording this i will i will come up with a plan and there will be a weapon under (laughs) my bed so for anybody listening who thinks they can get into my house that <laughs> yes. by the time you've heard this that you know that's no longer that that you know there's there's a plan my thing with that is i always think about where i'd hide mm. and i live in quite a small flat so there's not many places to hide i can't even get under my bed like you could probably just jump out the window onto the street in london though right well, and then you'll be okay. unless they're chasing you down down the street or if it's the purge and then you're in a whole other well scenario. this is true you're not safe inside or outside right and actually what a beautiful segue james let's get into it we're going to begin our first in-depth discussion on james de monaco's the purge from 2013 this is your emergency broadcast system announcing the commencement of the annual purge at the siren all emergency services will be suspended for 12 hours. Your government thanks you for your participation. Help me! Someone, please! Help me! I just need to get someone safe! Does anybody hear me? Let's go! This way! Hurry! This way, hurry! Why did you let him in our home? We have no idea who's after him. So one night every year, all of America gets a golden ticket to do whatever the hell they want without any of those pesky things called laws getting in the way. Now, this includes killing, raping and general pillaging. It's like an ultra violent Halloween where all the emergency services take a holiday and people embrace general chaos. So in this film, we follow one family who got super rich from the purge by selling foolproof, in inverted commas, security systems. 
on their quiet, non-violent family purge night, which is very quickly invaded from all sides by some well-to-do, plucky college purgers and their seemingly down and out prey. Lovely synopsis. Very good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I went a bit overboard with that. I can't lie. I enjoyed listening well, to it. I had fun. Um, so let me ask you both what you think of this film, first of all. Matt, what what do you think of The Purge? Like, what's your kind of history been with it? Because you covered it on the podcast, right? Was that like the first time that you had seen it? Or have you seen this a few times now? Yeah, I've seen this one a few times. I must have seen it around the time it came out. Um, and I thought it was a bit, I thought it was a bit forgettable the first mm. time I saw it. It kind of, I watched it, I didn't dislike it and I kind of just forgot about it. Um, and then it went on to like form this long running franchise. There's five or six films, I think TV show now, mm-hmm. I think as well. Um, it's been going forever, t- 10 yeah. years, isn't it? Um, but then revisiting it for, for, for our podcast, I really enjoyed it. I think it's a, a good film. It's, quite fun. I don't know if I, I was just so hardened and jaded from watching so many uh, dystopian films, and maybe you are as well from watching so many home invasion films, that this film is actually like quite fun compared mm. to some of the darker films. It's a, it's just like a good, fun little action thriller home invasion movie. Um, so I quite liked it. I'm also like, I'm such a sucker for Ethan Hawke, who I've really like discovered as an actor through the last couple of series of our mm. podcast. Um, I just think he's brilliant and I'll watch him in absolutely anything. So yeah, I, I like this film. I like it a lot. Yeah, he's so good. And actually, he's starred in quite a lot of little sort of horror films over the last decade as well. Like he's really, he loves a bit of kind of genre cinema as well, doesn't he? So good. Um, James, what do you think of The Purge? Yeah, I think the concept is a really great one. Like the idea that there are no laws for one night of the year and I think it just the way that they are commenting on America in general and that kind of like the societal issues that are happening over there. Yeah. I think with each of the Purge films that they've released, they've tried to focus on a different kind of aspect of that in some way. And then by doing it through this kind of dystopian horror film, they can kind of say quite a lot. But at the same time, that is giving them a lot of credit. They are quite mindless as well at the same time because of the nature of what it's about it's a it's a night where people can do whatever they want and run rampant so they're going to have some fun with that in, ter- in sort of horror genre terms right exactly that i agree with you i think it's it's this strange mix isn't it of it's kind of making a serious sort of social satirical point here and there are a lot of themes that it's trying to tackle like it's dipping its toe into tackling race into you know class economics gun control there are a lot of kind of interesting themes that this movie is kind of exploring in a way in in modern america but it's also this 80 minute blumhouse home invasion kind of schlock fest too right and i think i don't know i actually really like this movie i think people are a a bit down on it um and i can see why because i think there are some quite silly moments i think some of the characters do some quite stupid things and maybe it doesn't flesh out some of the meatier themes in the way that it should maybe it does it a little bit more in the sequels i don't know but i actually think that this movie is pretty effective in giving us a stripped back home invasion movie uh, but building this world around it right so they've created this whole world this dystopian future that i find quite terrifying the whole idea of it the concept of the purge is I think a really scary idea and I think by plonking us in the house of these white middle class uh, upper middle class people and just giving us the kind of I don't know the the perspective of them from inside the walls of this house is a kind of interesting way to frame this story I can see why some people have a problem with that and of course in the sequels they do expand this world and this universe beyond just this family's home right but but I actually like the kind of uh, the kind of uh, restricted perspective I suppose that we get here from the domestic space um, Matt how did you find that that kind of like insular view of this world I suppose yeah that's the best best way to start a franchise isn't it I don't know whether the the director intended it to be a franchise but I know he did direct two more and then kept producing as well so he's heavily Uh, personally invested in it so maybe he didn't always intend for that but it's the best way to tease out Mm. a franchise and a universe isn't it to have something quite high concept um in the in the broadest terms but actually 
set your film on a very small scale stage within that high concept. So yeah, we have this rich universe and it's hinted at with lots of great little touches like the blue flowers, the voiceover when we hear it, terms like the, are they called the new founding fathers? Yes. I think. Um, so these terms are just dotted throughout and they, they hold, the flowers hold some symbolic weight and new founding fathers is very loaded as well but you don't need to know anything else about that to tell this one small story that this film is about but it just teases out that universe and it perfectly sets up a a franchise model especially like an anthology franchise as well where you're not you're not committed to these characters and what may or may not happen to them on this night of the perch James, how did you find the way in which this movie fit in with the other dystopian films that you covered in that series of your podcast? Well, one of the things which I was thinking about when I was watching this is how close to the bone this kind of feels now in today's political landscape in the same way that The Handmaid's Tale feels very, very close to the bone. So I think with both of those kind of dystopian futures that are depicted in those and just the history of dystopia in general, the idea of people sort of turning a blind eye to what's really happening is really focused on especially in this when you're following a family who who know everything about the purge and they're seemingly supporting it Mm. but they're not going to participate so they are aware of it and they're very much like oh yeah it's just it's just a thing that we have to do because it's the way it is and that's just that's just how we do things now because we are we're saving America, we're saving the world, we've got rid of all of this debt and these economic issues that we were having before and this Mm -hmm. violence and this chaos. And now we just do it one night a year, so it's all good. So this idea of having a seeming seemingly like it's a dysto it's seemingly it's a utopia on the surface for these guys. And then underneath you've got the dystopian elements. And that's just how all dystopias work. They look like a utopia but you dig a little deeper and then you find the real darkness beneath. Yes. And I don't know, do you think, because what's interesting, Matt, as well, that 2013, the world and America was quite different to how it is now, right? And how do you think this film has aged 10 years on? You know, in light of some of the stuff that's happened in the world since this movie came out, right? Trump and lockdowns, because the word lockdown gets used a lot in this movie, right? Which is kind of interesting. Um, Insurrections, all out kind of almost civil war at times in the world, right? Since this movie has come out. Does that lend this movie any kind of extra weight for you when you rewatch it now yeah definitely it's like it's amazing how well it's aged um, yeah. you were saying how you find it more disturbing yeah um, it, it's because the 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 satire of it is sh- is felt more sharply now than it maybe would have been in in 2013 because especially the sort of the 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 social conflict and the idea that we have this uh, this black homeless man who is being pursued uh, and who is the sort of prime prey as James mm. referred to him uh, in the opening the prime prey of the uh, the group that are out purging on the night um that the the kind of the 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 social imbalance there and the racial imbalance as well i think it has become even more of a prominent topic of conversation in in american society and you know over here as well globally as well but but particularly in america since 2013 and, and and through to now and ongoing into now um, mm. so i think that satirical side of it has aged just incredibly well it was very yeah. um it was very sharp commentary at the time that has stayed relevant and got even more relevant i think i think that some of it is a little bit half baked too right and i think that's the other problem that some people have with this film you know james demonico <laughs> it's funny right because the story goes that he got the idea for this movie when involved in a road rage incident with somebody right and, it, and he actually kind of made a throwaway joke of like wouldn't it be great if we got a, a, freebie, a freebie you know yeah. like as in like joking about killing someone in a road rage what incident a weird thing to say <laughs> and then admit it's a to, weird thing to say. like yeah this is how i came up with my film i basically wanted to do it this is from when i wanted to kill someone <laughs> and thought i should be yeah. allowed to <laughs> exactly so i think that's that is weird right that that was the impetus for this story but you know i don't i I think the film is good i actually think the film's heart is in the right place and it is kind of exploring 
privilege and these kind of the, the, the monstrous kind of wealth in America and the differences in wealth and all of these kind of interesting themes. But I think maybe, I don't know, had this been made 10 years later, you know, if this was made now, would it have just been written by and made by a bunch of white guys? Because I think for a movie that is kind of dipping its toe into exploring race and racism, it doesn't do it in a particularly nuanced or fully realized way, I think. And maybe some of the sequels kind of do this a little bit better, but I feel like that might be a slight issue with this film too, right? Is that some of these issues feel a little bit almost tacked on um, and not explored as much as they could be, you know? Yeah, I mean, even just talking about, like you mentioned, Matt, the stranger, the I think is referred to as the bloody stranger or something along those lines. He's... He's a character who, again, isn't really fleshed out. You get a few bits in there, just he, he has dog tags, so you know he's some sort of war veteran. You get little pieces of information about him, but you don't really know who he is. And you just know that he is being preyed on by this group of white upper class teenagers, basically. And there is also the aspect of the fact that he is he's seen as a homeless person. But we don't know if he's necessarily a homeless person. We don't know no. his backstory. It's all very surface layer with these characters that you see. And I mean, even following this upper like upper middle class, can't they? This, this yeah. white family that we're following. I mean, looking at them in society and you don't really get a full picture. You're just kind of like in this in this bubble of what's going on yeah and and like i don't know what do you think matt is that a is that a kind of feature or a bug of this movie i guess in that (laughs) it's giving us such an insular view like it's choosing to tell this story via an upper middle class white family right so that is the only perspective we get we're inside the nice house we see everything through news footage and that's it it doesn't really take us outside does it beyond that kind of thing yeah i mean uh, I, i think that's fine i think that's who the movie is addressing it's addressing the the kind of people who uh you know keep themselves separate from those sorts of conversations and are just like well it doesn't affect me and i'm a good person and I, yeah. I, i'm not engaging in the purge but you know it's people's right to purge so you know i'm just going to sit here in the middle um yeah sort of morally and politically and they're thrust into a situation where they can't do that and they have to they have to address how they actually feel about this this person who's being hunted and the people who are doing the hunting and uh, mm. they actually get caught up in it in a way that they have been trying to like stay removed from and profiteer from even yeah and that is kind of clever isn't it i guess that like within this little small world they give us uh we get kind of all the different sides don't we we get like the 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 people that are actively participating in the purge you know which is this like gang of like rich monsters basically that come to the door and then you've got the 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 person that is the victim of the purge you've got the child that is sort of the only one that is against the purge right the little boy charlie and then you've got the parents that are these just kind of like apathetic like we're choosing not to participate but also we're not really doing anything about it we're sort of supporting it from afar right because like you say matt they plant a flower or something don't they outside the house to kind of show their support for the tradition of the purge but they don't actually want to take part in it they're kind of you know they almost act like they're a bit above it there's an interesting kind of satire there there's an interesting comment on that kind of hypocrisy almost isn't there i think of ethan hawke's character particularly you've also got sort of the upper upper class people in the neighborhood as well which adds an extra layer because they view this family as being lower than them right kind of and stealing their money so it's like that's another level down yeah and because they're not participating even though they've got the blue and white flowers and they're that i think they're dressed in blue and white for a lot of the beginning as well Mm. Because they ha- they're not participating and they're not embracing it in the same way that these upper class people are, they're looking down on them, and that's where they come towards the end and they they're trying to get their vengeance yeah and i think again like there are practical reasons too right why this first movie is so insular like this is an early blumhouse movie right and of course like blumhouse has this model of kind of low budget high concept i think at the time their model was one million dollar maximum budget and for that you can have complete creative control in what you do and the stories you tell um 
do you generally kind of matt do you find that you enjoy kind of these blumhouse movies these kind of like low budget high concept movies that we've had from them yeah it plays into something that i really like which is yeah what you just described low budget and high concept and it's a really interesting model for for a studio to take that kind of it's a bit of a challenger model not just in not just in terms of like a business model but but actually like challenging the idea of how a movie studio should operate and you do get really interesting ideas being put onto the screen but it also Mm. just gives that room for it gives a lot more room for failure like some of these films aren't very good but it doesn't matter because they don't spend an awful lot of money on them and they're making money hand over fist on a movie like the purge which makes like 50 times its budget back or whatever like it's you know very profitable uh, even by hollywood standards very profitable um so it just it, it it's just a really interesting way of making films um which i find really cool a cool thing that they do in blue max yeah i agree like i think uh, you're right like they they ha- they can afford failure can't they that's the thing like even if one in every five of their movies makes money then for them that is kind of a success so they do have a bit of a mix quality wise <laughs> of like good and bad stuff james how do you find like this kind of blumhouse model of, of films i think it's great because the film market is saturated by the big blockbusters and all of that kind of stuff and the franchises. And I know yeah. there are franchises that Blumhouse do as well, mm. but I think it's very important for cinema in general to have independent companies like this putting putting good, good people together and making hit or miss films but still taking a chance with it yeah definitely and they're always like a little nice sort of 90 to 100 minutes as well that's oh, another perfect. thing that is yeah love oh love it you know hour nolan film no oh, <laughs> exactly none of that nonsense exactly <laughs> um <laughs> so uh and and also they don't often have to rely on stars but actually this is one of the few movies that did have like names at the at the center of them right so you've got ethan hawk and lena heady as well what do you think of we i mean we've mentioned we all love ethan hawk right but what do you think of his character matt like and the way that his character is portrayed in this i think he's like perfectly on the line of being likable which i think is appropriate for where the family sits in the social strata and yeah. in the narrative they're they're right on the fence of everything and the fact that he is this kind of uh work upset workaholic um kind of a dick and very very openly just profiteering off the the concept of the purge without taking any kind of a moral opinion on the purge mm. um make him quite an interesting character and i guess go and get though those are all the reasons i don't like him but um then he he he's a sort of badass guy protecting his family for the rest of the film which which I do like, you know, in, in the final scenes. Um, and he has this kind of like, he, he wrestles with the morality of what he's going to do with the, the bloody stranger. And he, um, with some difficulty, lands on, on the right side of of, uh, of the conversation there. So, mm. you know, there's, there's I, I think he's like right on the line in a good way of yeah. whether you actually like him or not. Yeah, I think he's, I think that, yeah, they're not afraid to make him a bit of a dick, right? Like, I I feel like James, like, he's not supposed to be this kind of all-round heroic character, is he, I think, at the centre of this? Oh, no, definitely not. I mean, he is profiting from the purge, so it's in his best interests for it to carry on happening. Yeah. And also, you find out that he is selling security equipment that isn't foolproof and he knows it's not foolproof nothing is foolproof according to him in Mm -hmm. terms of these big million dollar security things that they're outfitting these houses with so i think that element to him just makes his sort of relationship to the purge a bit more complicated because he's he's very insistent that the the sort of they don't participate Mm -hmm. but at the same time he wants to keep it around and he he wants to be patriotic yeah and support it and yeah it's very it makes him a more complex character yeah for sure and actually again the the film doesn't give him an easy out you know he ends up dead at the end of the film right so i think you know i think there is an interesting element to his character too as this man who is kind of morally torn there are lines aren't there throughout lena heady says to him at one point you know while they're in the middle of all of this madness she says look at us look at what we've become and you get the feeling that even a few years earlier maybe these two were these slightly more progressive people they were poorer and then since they've made all this money from security since benefiting from the purge 
they have changed, right? He has certainly changed. And, you know, you do, I, I, I think he's presented as a bit of a dick from the beginning. You know, the, the awkward dinner scene with the family, love an awkward dinner scene in a home invasion movie, but the way he talks to his children, the way he loves to brag about making another sale and blah, blah, blah. Like he's money obsessed. He's kind of status obsessed too, right? And image obsessed, it feels like. And yeah, I think all of that kind of comes into play before the shit hits the fan. This is not a test. This is your emergency broadcast system announcing the commencement of the annual purge sanctioned by the US government. Weapons of class four and lower have been authorized for use during the purge. All other weapons are restricted. Government officials of ranking 10 have been granted immunity from the purge and shall not be harmed. Commencing at the siren, any and all crime, including murder, will be legal for 12 continuous hours. Police, fire, and emergency medical services will be unavailable until tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. when the purge concludes. Blessed be our new founding fathers and America, a nation reborn. May God be with you all. So the purge begins, right, with that chilling announcement. I do think it's a really chilling moment when that announcement happens, right? And there is something truly dystopian and scary about it. Um, and of course, initially, the family are very nonplussed, right? They're like, well, we're fine. We're safe in our house, whatever. We're going to have a night in. We're going to watch some movies, play some games, you know, whatever. Um, it's just like another lockdown day for them, basically, isn't it? But of course, things go terribly wrong when actually two people get into the house, right? There is this homeless black man who the son lets in because he's trying to help him, right? Um, but also, arguably... Well, not arguably, actually. The Definitely the much more dangerous person that has got into the house is the daughter's boyfriend, right? This idiot teenage boy who has sort of hidden in the house for when lockdown began. And he's like, I want to go talk to your dad um, so that I can convince him that, you know, we should be together. Actually, what he's done is brought a gun into the house and he's going to kill her dad, right? Which is mental because I just think, what's his plan ultimately? Like, he's going to shoot his girlfriend's dad and then what, she'll want to be with him? Him. like it's not it, it, he hasn't thought this through right but i think there's a that's a terrific moment i think this kind of moment of absolute panic when the parents realize that this homeless man has got into the house but also this other guy has gotten into the house and taken a shot at them as well and i think it's interesting too that they seem to be much more concerned with the homeless black man who's loose in their house than they are with the white kid who actually mm. has the gun and is actively trying to shoot them, you know. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're saying like, what's the what's the boyfriend's plan? I think on, on the one hand, he's just a sort of dipshit teenager who who hasn't thought two steps ahead of of his plan, but a more like a more charitable sort of uh, impression of him would be that like he's he's a product of a purge society. He's very young. He's probably lived a good portion of his life in 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 purge times so this this idea of solving your problems on purge night with a gun is completely just like bred into him like he, he doesn't know another way of mm. thinking about the world really um but i do also think he's just sort of a, a dipshit horny teenager who hasn't thought about <laughs> what he's doing but i do i do love that scene that you're talking about where it all just goes to shit immediately shots being fired there's two people in the house who shouldn't be in the house you know on a night when nobody should be in the house um mm. and also like from a home, home invasion perspective it's like it's almost a series of home invasion red herrings isn't it because yeah you've got two people in this scene who are quote unquote home invaders but they're not the people we need to be worried about in this film right yeah and then even by the end of the film the people we think we're worried about are not the people we need to be worried about and there's like a final home yes. invasion we have like four home invasions yes it's this series of red herrings about who you actually want to be worried about in this world yeah the mad middle class women uh, the final scene yeah. who basically it feels like a little setup to soft and quiet that final sequence in the purge doesn't it but yeah like that that's true actually you were right like you get these different home invaders and it's like who is who it's like this hierarchy of who's the most dangerous and who's the most monstrous potentially and this is something that gets Again, this is a kind of early example of something we've seen loads in the last 10 years in horror is this kind of eat the rich subgenre where, you know, like Parasite is a massive example of this, like 
Oscar winning movie, which is essentially a home invasion movie. And you've seen it in genre films like Jordan Peele's Us as well. And this idea of kind of putting the haves and the have nots under one roof and kind of, and, and the kind of bloodshed that ensues essentially. <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand. Who is he? Why did you let him in our home? He was hurt. He called for help. No one was helping. Charlie, Jesus Christ, what the hell, huh? We have no idea what this man is no. capable of. No, James. He's gone. We don't know what Henry might do. And we're not safe out here. We don't know where Zoe is. You're right. Let's go. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. So then what follows is this creepy kind of cat and mouse uh, section of the film essentially right where you've got these people in the house hiding but we don't quite know where they are and of course most of you know 90 percent of the action takes place in the confines of this house as it does with so many home invasion films um james what do you think of this particular house and the way in which this director kind of i don't know kind of presents us with the geography of the space throughout this film i think one of the most interesting aspects is the use of the remote control baby on the oh yeah creepy yeah, because that instantly makes it seem voyeuristic, doesn't it? You've mm. got this this different low angle viewpoint that you're viewing everything from. And you've got this scared little kid who's hiding in the back of his wardrobe, watching everything happen. Mm -hmm. So I think that really aligns you with him because also his character is the only sort of, like we said earlier, he's the one who who questions the purge. Yeah. Everyone else is kind of just like, yeah, it's fine. This is what we do. So I think having that and exploring the house and the geography of the house through that is quite interesting. And then later on, you find all these different rooms in the house as well, because it's a big house, isn't it? It's, they're getting an extension. Yes. They've got a, they've got a games room. They've mm. got all of these different rooms that just keep cropping up. So it does seem bigger and bigger. Yeah. But also it's supposed to be this impenetrable fortress as well. They've got this big door on the front which is which they need to use a tow truck to get rid of all of these aspects make you think that you're in this really this really safe place but it's not safe i like that that geography is very i thought quite unclear throughout the film like we we know it's a very big house and there's seemingly limitless space for uh action to happen in and it does take place in different rooms and we get to explore it through that little toy that you're talking about james but i there's i don't think there's ever a clear sense of what the geography is uh, and that's that's good for a home invasion film well i mean you can you can there's multiple ways to do it isn't there but that's a that's one good way of doing it is that like the audience doesn't know yes. what's through the next door and that creates a sense of not feeling safe doesn't it like you don't know you, you don't know what's going to be there or where the weak points are, where the bad guys are going to get in, smash a window, mm. all of this. Um, and it just makes for more interesting action scenes, I think, as well. Yeah. It's interesting the way different films have kind of done that. You've got films like Panic Room, where David Fincher very meticulously yeah. gives us a whole room-by-room -room tour of the mm. house before the shit hits the fan. And then you've got, on the other side of that, you've got movies like parasite or the people under the stairs where like the house is like this labyrinth of corridors and spaces within walls and this movie's more like that isn't it there's like little secret cubby holes and it feels like there are lots of places that you could hide in this movie and i guess like again practically you need something like that for a movie like this don't you if you're going to set the whole thing in a house you need space to kind of put your characters and, and eke it out but also the thing which boggled my mind was why don't they have an actual panic room in this security yes. laden house they there's one moment where they're just sat in like a room and they're like just stay here but it they don't even try and lock a door or anything they just say i think ethan hawk says to his um to his wife and his daughter just stay here but yeah it's just not a safe room is it i know that a lot of people i read just on letterbox like i skimmed through people's reviews and a lot of people quite down on this movie like giving it kind of two stars and lower and i think people find the characters very irritating and the the 
the stupid moves that the characters make in order to like Ethan Hawke keep like continuously saying to his kids like just go and sit upstairs for a bit or you know not all <laughs> staying together not keeping track of where everyone is and I don't know did was that ever a problem for you Matt that were these did, were you were these characters ever too mind-numbingly stupid for you at any point <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's a pretty silly film and, and yeah. some of the characters are um not so much characters as plot devices certainly the the homeless man is is just a plot device and um the 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 main speaking leader of the of the purges you know yes. he's not really a character but i think he's brilliant because he's really scary and over the top um and creepy and weird uh so that doesn't it just doesn't really bother me i think that there's an element of there's there's a bit of an element of camp to this film. Not it's not the overriding sort of experience of it, but it's certainly there. Um, and I just don't think it's altogether the most serious movie. It is a dystopian horror thriller satirical critique on American society, and that's much more important than than whether or not Ethan Hawke is making sensible decisions for for his family during the events of the plot. Yeah, why you're right. He, why yeah. does he pick the smallest gun though? He's got a massive <laughs> shotgun in there, and he picks he uses the tiniest the shotgun, gun. James, what do, what do yeah, you mean? but not till the end. I mean, these people. Well, you've got to escalate. You can't just you, you can't, if you've got a series of, of of guns increasing in size, then you know you have to you have <laughs> you've to, got to take them use one them at a time. In, yeah, yeah, increasing. Uh, you've got to scare them straight away. Of need. Well, then you don't need <laughs> a little gun, do you? <laughs> James, if you had your way, there'd be no film to watch. Like, just put them in a panic room with a big gun, they'll all be fine. That's it, the end. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, got, got, got a rocket launcher sitting in the back of a panic <laughs> This is This is the preparations that you need. If I was in this situation, this is what I'd want. I think you're right about the panic rooms. I, I don't know why Mr. Sandin isn't selling panic rooms. That seems like a no-brainer. That's a very good point. I guess the point of the house is the whole house is supposed to be like a giant panic yes, yeah. room, isn't it? Except that it's bollocks. Again, it's like <laughs> this fun, slight comment on just kind of capitalism and everything there as well, isn't it? I think that he's yeah. selling everyone a lie. That these, American these, made. <laughs> yeah, that the, yeah, exactly. That these, these American made uh, systems are actually rubbish. Um, so everything's going pretty badly for them anyway. And then, of course, the doorbell rings and our gang of purgers are at the door. They know that the man they've been hunting all night is in the house. They want that man out so that they can murder him. And this is where Ethan Hawke and his family have this moral dilemma, right? Do we chuck the homeless man out onto the street to make life easier for us? Or do we protect him and risk our lives? Mr. and Mrs., the man you're sheltering is nothing but a dirty homeless pig. A grotesque menace to our just society who had the audacity to fight back killing one of us when we attempted to execute him tonight. The pig doesn't know his place, and now he needs to be taught a lesson. You need to return him to us. Alive. So we may purge as we are entitled. So the purgers, we don't really find out much about them, right? Except that they are these, like, rich, tough, homicidal twats basically right uh, the leader played by reese wakefield who is incredibly creepy and charismatic uh, james what do you think of him and, and this kind of gang of home invaders it's very clockwork orange isn't it yes yeah that's what i think the way that he speaks he's very eloquent with his words yet he's got this sinister nature to him and everything he says is very calculated and concise and that makes him more scary because mm -hmm. the way that he he is saying, look, it's purge night. We're the good guys. We are just exercising our rights. So this is all fine. And I think there is something just 10 times more scary about this kind of character than some crazed maniac running around. And then add into that all this weird childlike surreal stuff they're doing there's a whole little montage sequence almost when the kids watching these security cameras and yes. there's one of them on a swing and i think the girl is more terrifying to me because she yeah. 
That's because she's like supernatural in her <laughs> movements and stuff. And there's one moment she just screams in the wife's face. Yeah. Just yeah. out of nowhere. And I was like, yeah, that would scare the shit out of me. I, and there's something about the way that the girls in that gang look and dress and act that made me think of the Manson family as well. Like yeah. we've talked about the Manson family a lot throughout this series, as you can imagine, like this kind of real life home invasion that essentially is the, is the thing that sparked home invasion in, in cinema. But um, they're like a kind of upper class class manson family almost mm. it feels like these people matt what do you make of this like this gang of purges yeah like a preppy M- manson family yeah and the, <laughs> so but like the manson family and the clockwork orange comparison that james made are really interesting because they they both borrow from those tropes they oh, sorry they, they borrow from both of those tropes mm. um but they are explicitly within the universe of the, of the purge they're accepted by society they're not outsiders yeah. they're not freaks they're all they're the haves yeah yeah they're the haves yeah they're 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 upstanding citizens and they are we're like you that's what he says on the on the Mm. on the door cam to to sand in so like they they're not like alex in the clockwork orange they're like alex if society wanted alex to be how he is Mm -hmm. um they're 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 part of the actual bread and butter of, of society in this yeah. world. And this, of course, is where it becomes... It, it's using real iconography from real home invasion horror movies at this point, right? The masks are reminiscent of the strangers. Like I've already mentioned, they have a kind of a way about them of the Manson family. There's a bit of a clockwork, a clockwork orange about them. Like There is kind of elements of cinematic history in this gang and the way they're portrayed. But like you say, with this slight twist, because so often those gangs are the have-nots, but in this movie, they are the opposite, right? So So that's kind of interesting. Um, And finally then, what do you guys make of the final act of this film where we get yet another threat that emerges for this family? And it's their neighbours, right? Their neighbours who initially seem to be there to save them from this other gang. But then, of course, it's because they want to kill them themselves. Their neighbours kind of resent this family for having more money than them or having a bigger house or whatever. It's it's all a bit silly, this. But what do you think of this kind of final section of the movie? Oh, I like it because it's so inexplicable as to what the hell is going on when it starts happening <laughs> because they're suddenly saved by their neighbours and you think, okay, maybe the neighbours are, are doing them a favour, but you know something's going to happen as soon as it starts kicking off. Mm. And yeah, I, I like that as an aspect. It's like there's always somebody else around your neighbour or your boss or your work colleague or it could be a friend or something like that. Someone has an axe to grind Yes. And on this night, they're going to get you if they can. I think that's the thing about this film, and we'll talk about this with Soft and Quiet as well. Like, the, it feels like there's just so much rage in both these movies like rage from the filmmakers rage from the characters and yeah as it turns out even their neighbors their friends hate them and are furiously angry with them right and want to kill them and this is again where it gets into really kind of it's very hard satire at this point because i think it's going for a kind of comedy almost right i think by the time we get to these like monstrous suburbanites but matt w- what do you think of this final section yeah i love the ending for for exactly that reason like there there is campness throughout the film but the the, the very ending uh after they decide not to kill the neighbors and keep them prisoner for the rest of the night is is the when lena heady just gets really cross and just makes everyone yeah. sit in silence for yeah. the night yeah it's the it's the it's the real overt comedy scene of the film isn't it it's where it really yes. tips over into that because i think the most logical ending of the film is that that she makes the correct moral decision and chooses not to kill them lets them all go home and they see out mm-hmm. the night in safety and then just get away from it all that's that's Mm. a perfectly acceptable resolution to the plot but just to tack on this little the little kicker that like she doesn't just turn them away she has to like keep them prisoner and then yeah we have this weird tense silly conversation Mm -hmm. around the kitchen table where she's like did you enjoy the party yes like (laughs) it's it tips over fully into comedy for the very end which is a bit of a strange decision but i think it just it just underlines that ele- element of silliness and self-awareness throughout the film by giving it a little a little gag button at the end of it after Definitely. you know after the main character's been stabbed to death and died and all of that like 
still having some comedy just to wrap it's it up. It's part of that satire, isn't it? Like these 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 upper middle class characters are basically just a bit of a joke, really, in this film, essentially, right? And all of a sudden, it's like that moment when they're all having to just sit quietly around the table. It's like suddenly none of them seem scary or dangerous anymore as well. This is the thing, right? And, and that upper middle class characters can be like disarmed and diffused by social rules and right. conversation and social mores and stuff like that that's how she gets them she just sort of she, i mean she has a gun on them but she's also able to disarm their scariness by just telling them off basically and putting them in their place uh, very satisfying of- when she smashes one of their heads against yeah, the table really well. <laughs> yes i was gonna say that feeds into what you're saying as well matt because the social norm of those characters are they're upper middle class they're smart and they're looking at after their appearance mm. and she's more annoyed about what her nose is going to look like yeah than the actual so, act yeah. itself from looks of it someone's got to get their face smashed in haven't they at the end there <laughs> Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> um, so there you go. And let me just quickly ask you, like, there have been, like you said, Matt, a, a load of sequels. There's been a TV show of this. I've not caught up with the TV show or some of the last couple of sequels. But James, what about you? How much of the Purge universe have you checked out? I think I've seen most of it. I've definitely watched the TV show. How was it? Yeah, I've, I thought it was all right. But then huh. it's just kind of like mindless watching. Mm-hmm. And it follows... It, I think the first series maybe starts off at a Purge. And then afterwards, it's the build up to the Purge and kind of what these characters are doing in the meantime. Right. So you're wondering about what's going to happen in the big payoff so that's quite an interesting aspect of the tv series and the other ones they all go off on different tangents and they go different timelines as well there's like the first purge which explains how it first kicked off there's the forever purge which is like a full-blown civil war just happening forever everyone's escaping to mexico i think in that one there's there's lots of different ways that they go about telling this this story and different avenues to explore it. The quality of the films isn't always great. No, no. But I think the concepts it, concepts still enough to to get me to watch it. Yeah, they've they sort of blur a bit to me the sequels as well because I've definitely seen a few of them. But beyond this one, which is this kind of taut home invasion, the rest of them are much more sprawling, aren't they? They're, they're like out mm. on the streets, and you you're with politicians, and you're with gangs, and you're with different. Like it really kind of it expands the world massively, doesn't it? I think, and um, yeah. I think some people preferred that than this kind of like stripped back home invasion format. But for me, I think I I kind of like the way they choose to tell the story here in just like giving us glimpses of this outside world and this history you know and i think a few of these characters return in some of the sequels i know the stranger becomes part of like a rebel group i think Mm, mm -hmm. and yeah they like you say it's sprawling lots of stuff happens there's so many films hard to keep track Hello, everybody. Before we get into the second half of this week's discussion, just going to take a minute to thank this week's sponsor. That's $20 Patreon subscribers, uh, Sam and Ralph in Seattle. Sam and Ralph sent me a little message, which I'm going to read out now. They said, hello, Mike. We are two EOH listeners from Seattle, Washington. We look forward to every season and every episode of the show, and we've loved listening to you and your fantastic guests along the way. Recently, we started hosting our own podcast called The Scroll. Screaming Room. We call our show the only podcast about horror movies. We consider ourselves neither experts nor newbies to the genre, but we're excited to share our journey through the films that we love. Each week, we run down what films we've seen, discuss horror news that catches our attention, and have a long-form discussion about a featured film. We primarily focus on new releases. We've recently covered Talk To Me and Brooklyn 45. We have also just finished a rewatch of the Insidious franchise before reviewing 2023's Insidious The Red Door. Currently, we are recapping the entire Saw franchise in preparation for the release of Saw X. We'd love to get some feedback from EOH listeners, especially those in our queer and trans family. The Screaming Room is available everywhere podcasts are found. We can also be found on Twitter at The Room Cast. Thank you for all your work on Evolution of Horror. We both love the show. 
are fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for that message, Sam and Ralph. And I will be sure to check out The Screaming Room. That's a great name for a podcast, for one thing. I love the title. Uh, So I'll be sure to check that out and make sure if you're listening, if you're looking for more horror podcasts to listen to, and why wouldn't you be? We can never have enough of those. Uh, Please check out The Screaming Room, which you can find wherever you get your podcasts. One more time, a huge thank you to this week's sponsors. That's Sam and Ralph in Seattle, hosts of The Screaming Room. And don't forget, if you want to become an official Evolution of Horror sponsor, get your own little dedicated segment in the middle of an episode just like this one, then you simply need to sign up to our Patreon at the top tier of $20 per month. And for that, you will also get a whole back catalogue of over 200 bonus episodes. And we've got some brilliant bonus episodes coming up across the month of October. So I would recommend signing up. Patreon.com slash evolution of horror. That's patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Okay, let's hurtle into the second half of this week's episode. One more time, I will issue a little trigger warning for this particular film, which contains pretty grueling scenes of kind of racial, hateful abuse and language, as well as extreme violence, torture and sexual violence. It's 2022's Soft and Quiet. I am really, really happy that we are finally doing this. Today, I just want us to introduce ourselves, you know, get, get to know each other. There's, there's no agenda that needs to be accomplished. Um, oh, yay! Oh, 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 I, I'm a teacher down at the, uh, the school and... Everything thus far has been a step in the right direction in the magazine, but we want to be careful with this first issue, right? We want to engage the mainstream, right? We, we, we can't come on too strong, okay? Soft on the outside, so vigorous ideas can be digested more easily. Mm. Now, we are the best secret weapon that no one checks at the door because we tread quietly. Uh, so Soft and Quiet tells the story of um, a group of white supremacist women who form a little white supremacist support group called, I think they're called the Daughters of Aryan Unity. Um, and the film picks up at what I think is the the first meeting of that group as they're trying to establish themselves as, as a little neo-Nazi white supremacist group. Uh, the, the film then follows them follows them home from that meeting in one take throughout the whole movie uh, where they have an altercation with two Asian women at a supermarket owned by one of the daughters of Aryan Unity. Um, And then they decide to go to those girls' home, house, um, out out of town, and uh, they end up killing both of them or attempting to kill both of them and then disposing of their bodies in a lake. Yeah. How much of that plot did you know before you watched the film? A- absolutely nothing. I just knew that I was watching um, what I presumed to be a horror movie uh, for the evolution of horror and what I expected to be a home invasion movie. That, that's, all, yeah. that's literally all I knew about it. I didn't know anything else. Uh, I, same here. I, when I first watched it last year, it was at South by Southwest Festival it played and I saw it. And at that point, there wasn't even a synopsis of it. So I had no idea what to expect. And at that reveal, about 15 minutes in with the pie gets unveiled and you're like, oh, that's who these people are. Oh, shit. This is the film that we're in. It's a real kind of gut wrenching moment, isn't it? I think, James, what what did you think of this? How much did you know going into it? I didn't know much at all. Uh, Subsequently, I looked it up online and it's just it blew up on TikTok, didn't it? Yes one of the most horrendous films out there and it's kind of built up a buzz through that Mm -hmm. which i found quite interesting yeah but yeah i wasn't prepared for what was happening in this film (laughs) Uh, but even even that reveal that you're talking about i think and knowing that i was going into a home invasion film i still didn't know what kind of home invasion we were dealing with and whether 
well, whether they were going to be the perpetrators or the victims, basically. Yeah, it's one of those movies where <clears throat> I recommended it last year on Patreon and um, me and Brad and Becky and Louise, we all talked about it very vaguely and we sort of told people to check it out, but we said, don't read anything about it, just pop it on, you know? And and I think part of me regrets that a little bit, actually, because part of me is like, oh, maybe I need to trigger warn people about this film more before I recommend it. Because it is a really, really, really tough going film, right? But um, but I think there is power in not knowing what this film is actually going to be about when you hit play, right? Because we've got this single take, 90 minute journey with these characters. And when it begins, we really don't know what, what we're watching and what film we're in for, right? We see this character, this main character called Emily, played by Stephanie Estes, brilliant performance, right? And she... She's this kind of like, you know, seemingly friendly woman at the beginning. She's a teacher. She's talking to a little child that's upset. She's carrying with her something like a pie covered in tinfoil. And she's going to a meeting in a little church hall, right? And she meets these other women and they all seem kind of friendly and they're making small talk. And you think, oh God, what's going to happen to these women? Is something horrible going to happen to them? You still have no idea where this is going at this point, right? Here, let me take this from you. You got it. Thank you. We have been snacking and waiting for 25 minutes. I'm sorry, there's a straggler at school, you know. And you don't know what's happening. You don't know really where this is going until that moment about 10 minutes in when they pull the tinfoil off the apple pie or the cherry pie, whatever it is. And there, carved in the top of the pie, is a swastika. Way of saying thank you for coming. Oh, fuck, that looks amazing. We're in a church. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. It just it looks so good. And this is such a chilling, almost, it's almost a funny moment, I think, because it's so extreme and it's so not what you're expecting, I think, when you don't know anything about it. And I think that is part of the journey that you're supposed to go on in this film, right? Because the point of it is that these women don't look like your typical cross-burning racists, right? And so I think that that rug pull is deliberate. And that's why I did tell people initially to go in without reading too much or without, you know, finding out too much. And I think that image of the pie too, right, is just so perfect. It, You know, this kind of this, this symbol of wholesomeness that we might associate with that kind of like, I don't know, that kind of 50s housewife archetype almost mixed with this symbol of hate, right, and evil. And then, of course, we sit there in this meeting with these white supremacists for about half of the film's runtime we are just watching this meeting play out as they all tell their stories who they are why they hate people of color you know why they feel hard done by we get to know each of these characters it is james how did you find it you know this is this is before we even get to any kind of home invasion or overt horror but how did you find that kind of uh, that experience of, of watching this? It was very affecting. I mean, there's so many little bits that they kind of tease out at the beginning, just even before the, the pie reveal. Yeah. There's this bit at the beginning where the teacher, the woman who, who we follow for the majority of the film, yeah. she's looking at the cleaner and yes. you're getting this weird vibe. And then it's what she said to the kid. And there's a moment where she's telling this kid story that she's made. And then the sound goes away from what she's reading. And you're instantly like, okay, what the hell is she telling this kid? Mm -hmm. And then it goes into, then she tells the kid to go and tell the cleaner off who has done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. And all those little bits leading up to it, mm -hmm. we're just sort of building up the anticipation. Then when you see them, gathering for the group and then there's the the stuff they start talking about slowly but surely it gets more and more extreme yeah and just you realize what you're in for for this film just in terms of the subject matter and it is it's a lot but i think it's also something that you need to see on screen yeah i agree it's really um it's like, and this is a word that I've used a lot in talking about home invasion movies. It's, it's uncomfortable as well. Like some of the best home invasion films, like we talked about things like Funny Games, the Michael Haneke movie and some of these others, like they're really deeply uncomfortable because you're just stuck with these characters that are abhorrent most of the time. And I think like Matt, that first half 
is is in a in a in a funny kind of way almost as horrific right as the 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 horrific stuff that happens in the second half like the way in which that conversation kind of escalates between those women the language being used and the way in which as they get more relaxed they use more and more kind of horrific language and and they become more themselves it's like I, it's pretty well written and well performed in a way, isn't it? In just how powerful it is. I think. Yeah, the performances are amazing because they are scarily believable. All of the right. six, is it six, six women, I think, in the meeting. Yes. And then f- four of them go on together afterwards. But the, those six women are all all very believable and they're all very um, different in mm-hmm. their hate. They all have, they have a, a range of sort of reasons for 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 being racist like there's there's one that uh feels hard done by by a colleague um who who's not white and then there's there's one who's like the daughter of a prominent but a pretty prominent kkk member so she's yeah she's like old school racist yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly yeah um and then you uh and is it emily the the, the kind of ringleader the main character she's She's the kind of she's all about family and purity of bloodlines and, yeah. and a, a women's role in in the household and stuff like that. So we've got all these dimensions of of white supremacism represented in the room, which which is obviously a very deli- deliberate thing in the writing to to bring out all these aspects, um, but to then make them all feel like quite believable characters. Uh, even though it's been carefully written, so they're all sort of representing a different element of, of of white supremacy. That's that's quite an achievement to to do that through the performances and make all those women feel real. Diversity, inclusion. It's like they're speaking in fucking code. You know what I mean? It's on every fucking form. You know, every government form, every employment form, every fucking receipt. You know what I mean? And 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 yeah. So I just I don't know what to do. And I <clears throat> I guess that's why. I'm here. Hey, thank you for sharing and and, and for speaking up for yourself. Marjorie, just know you are in good company, okay? Mm -hmm. We all kind of feel how you feel and anything you gotta say, you're safe to get it out here. It feels so scary and insidious the way that they use certain language and, you know, as the title suggests, James, right? These, this group of women look they look unthreatening, I guess you'd say, right? There is a politeness in the way they speak. They are supportive of each other. But that rhetoric, that language that slowly starts to creep in is is so toxic and so vile and so frightening, right? And I think there is something very, I don't know, there's something very believable about it. We've seen stuff on social media like this, and I believe that there are people out there like this that speak like this. Yeah, you know? and, I, and I saw an interview with the director, and she was talking about the research she was doing prior to making this film. And she said, this is what was happening in the world of white supremacists as it Mm. is. Like this Mm -hmm. isn't, this isn't just conjured up out of thin air. This is something that is happening and people are like white supremacists are, they're acting in this way. They're putting on this sort of soft front to make it appeasable. And I think she used the word, uh these women are making themselves look like instagram influencers Mm. to kind of get people in on the ground floor and then slowly but surely put sow these little seeds and then sort of influence people that way because like influence and influencers in general are called influencers for a reason yes because they are influencing people's behavior and then if you've got these very dark agendas it becomes because they talk a lot about like oh the mainstream media is all brainwashing you yes. and all this kind of stuff in their meeting, but they're they're what they want to do exactly the same thing that they're suggesting yeah. other people are doing. So it's all very contradictory, and yeah, it's 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 too it's it's too terrifying to think yeah, about. Yeah, it's too close to the bone, isn't it? I think you know, like that gang of clearly very racist, murderous people in the purge are like you said matt they're campy they're over the top they wear masks they dance around you know threatening to kill people like they're they're much more overtly monstrous right whereas there's something about these women and the way they're written and portrayed where it's like 
it, it's so much more chilling, I think, isn't it, in a different kind of way? Yeah, but I think like the, it also, in a way, I mean, probably because we were watching them at the same time, but it feels a bit like a prequel to the purge. Yeah, it? it does. It feels like these are, these are the women who who sowed the seeds of the new founding fathers of America, and the purge world seems like a world they might be very happy to live in, mm. um, and they would be very content to sort of lead the country down that path yes there's something very chilling too isn't there about the fact that the the main character is a teacher and that she's yeah. influencing mm. children and there's all this talk about how they want to open their own school so that they can teach what they want to teach and all of that and it's like yeah there's just this chilling idea that like they they want to change the world and change the future yeah and of course the impetus for this whole thing was that the writer and director beth jarriujo uh, she came up with the idea for this movie based on the central park bird watching incident right from 2020 which was this this incident that kind of went viral on social media may 25th essentially it's this altercation between two people in central park this woman called amy cooper um who essentially just like completely unnecessarily went ballistic at a black man who was just keeping to himself minding his own business doing some bird watching right and uh, she kind of i don't know she lost it and and accused him of attacking her she yelled at him and then she called the police and says there is a black man uh, you know attacking me threatening myself and my dog please send cops immediately and it, you can see it in the video it's just it's just it's just this vile overt racism right from this woman and it brought so much visibility to this particular type of racist right that exists um and this kind of middle class white woman and the way in which she reacts to a black man in central park and yeah this whole thing went viral it kind of the the, the term karen was already an existing term at this point but it really kind of popularized it as well and kind of created this slang term for this type of white woman this racist right white woman right who's now known as a karen and this is this is kind of karen the movie right karen yeah. the horror movie i mean it's the escalation in in that video you're referring to as well the escalation in her voice comes out of nowhere and it really brings to light what's happening mm -hmm. sort of with these with these kind of people and yeah it's a scary thing to watch and also it was reminding me of sort of because around covid there was a big surge in violence against asian people yes after that so again this kind of rings true here because you're seeing it in in sort of like in the filmic terms in in this film scenario yeah but that was such a big prominent thing yeah i remember around about that time there just being so much of so much surge of violence mm. happening well i mean like i mean again you talk about these kind of influencer figures you Trump was like the ultimate influencer in this kind of behavior, wasn't mm. he? And he he deliberately kept wording it as the China virus during coronavirus, right? Yep. And it kind of sparked that that hatred, that racism, you know, that anger. And again, you see that. I mean, that's overtly there. There are references to that overtly in the script, right? In that scene, the Asians come over, they take over companies, get us sick. I don't say anything, you know. Mm. And then. <sighs> urban kids right they can't even spell their name and they get into better colleges than me and it's like okay still fine i don't say anything but then i'm the racist mm -hmm. it's like there's nothing left for me in this country and i think one of the things that's really cleverly deployed in this as well is this sort of single take as well where we are just stuck i think that's the other thing about this movie is that it feels like there is absolutely no room to breathe at any point like we're in small spaces all the time right up up close and personal with these racists um and it never stops right like matt how do you find the whole single take element of this do you think that it was you know was it was it worth it i suppose in using it for this story yeah i think it is worth it i think it's a really interesting deployment of a, a single take movie i think usually from what i've seen the, the single take films that I've seen tend to, I mean, they it, it ramps up intensity a lot to to make a film in that way. Yeah. Um, but it generally is used as a device to make the audience feel um, sympathetic and empathetic to the the main character because we're sharing time and space with them. So we're we're in a place with them, and if things are getting more and more intense, you're it's kind of like a shared experience with that character, so you feel sympathy. Mm. And this is one of the first times I've seen a film 
not use it to that effect because we don't feel sympathetic to the main characters that we're spending all of this time with in the film. Yes. I think in this film it's deployed more as like showing us how quickly these people who have all this hate in their hearts who are having a meeting and they they're using all this language like well we're not doing anything wrong we're just having a conversation we should be free to you know exercise our free speech and talk about our opinions and all of that Mm -hmm. um but but within a single take and over the course of 90 minutes of their lives it can escalate to the most horrific thing you've ever seen and that there's they are just on this knife edge when these people are that hateful that like if you spend 90 minutes with them it can go somewhere incredibly dark incredibly quickly Mm -hmm. um i think that's what's being done here with the single take and i found that really interesting yeah you kind of can't take your eyes away can you from yeah. them even when they're having like mundane conversations in the car about like oh you should model my clothes sometime and stuff i don't know there's like none of it feels like filler or downtime like it yeah james how did you find it the kind of single take element of this i think it yeah like matt was saying it keeps that tension going throughout yeah and also just the way they're exploring the space you're kind of like a fly on the wall yeah seeing these things but also the thing which i kept thinking about was because this this series you're doing is home invasion mm. and the spaces they're in are for these for these white women the majority of them are supposed to be safe spaces yeah like when they're in the church it's a safe space mm-hmm. that you can chat about all of these horrendous things that you all agree upon and even the church and, is like yeah. fuck off <laughs> no that's wrong you've invaded my church yeah. get out yeah. and then when they go to the shop that one of them owns that's another space, safe space for them. But then for them, they're like, oh, we've been invaded mm. by these two women. And then they flip that on them. And then for the final bits, you're you're following them invade someone else's home yes. and their space, safe space. And they're in power still because they've constantly got the power. And then the only place where it kind of feels like they're, they don't have control at all is that open sea bit towards the end. So it's really using all of these spaces in a really interesting way to show who's got the power at every point. Yeah, you're so right. That's so interesting. And like the the, the constant kind of ludicrous, the hypocrisy as well of them constantly talking about America being their space and all of these people Mm. coming to it unwelcomed, right? And yet all they do is go into other spaces where they're not welcome throughout this entire film as well. And it makes you complicit as well as an audience member when they when they finally go to the girl's house. Um because you've been sharing space with them now for I don't know, maybe an hour by the time we actually get to the the, the house. Um it makes you the viewer, the the home invader in this film because you are on this journey with them, whether you want to be or not, but you feel complicit in the events because you're you're there and you're seeing it as one of the women would be seeing it. And obviously there are basically no redeeming features to these characters that we're stuck with, right? But it is interesting to see the different types of racism here, the different types of white supremacist, as you said, Matt, and how they all became these people that they've become, and then how they all react differently to what happens during this horrific home invasion, right? When they realise they have killed a human being, the different ways in which some of them react, some of them panic, some of them don't, some of them, you know, scream. Do you think there's any remorse there? Is there any compassion in any of these women when they've done what they've done? I think because all of the characters feel like realistic people, there is that element involved as well because one's kind of like almost like a soccer mum. Yeah. And then one of them well, like, works at a, a shop or something like that. And then you're right, their reactions to what's happening in the actual home invasion differs as well. There's the one who is in prison who... Terrifying. Reacts Absolutely straight terrifying. Straight away, she <laughs> takes control. She knows what she wants to do. Yeah. She's all about that. And then you've got the other... And they keep changing their minds between what they they think they should do in terms of this group, this pack that they're in. And they sort of have this pack mentality about what they're doing. But then every once in a while, one of them will realize what's actually happening. Yes. And there's a scene where one of them's hyperventilating. One of them's like, I've got to get home. I've got to, I I can't go to prison. What about my kids? Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, you've got this male character as well. Who's thrown in. There's some interesting like gender dynamics at play too in this film, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because also they're, 
they're saying it's um, feminine, not feminism. Yes. And stuff like that. Yet the way she is acting as well, she's she's really taking control of their relationship and getting him to do what she wants him to do. Yeah, like that really surprised me when we meet the husband because I had in my head that the husband was going to be this horrendous, bullish you know, macho, racist, uh, you know, quote unquote alpha, right? And he's he's actually not that, you know? Well, he's not the, he's not this extremely strong man that she paints him out to be, that she seems to be attracted to. Not not from what we see of him. Um, She's even making references to use your upper body strength when he's (laughs) helping them get out of the car. And it almost seems sarcastic. Like he's, he's just like lifting up the back seat. Like it's not um so that was quite interesting wasn't it that he i it, from what we see of him in the film he is not the the character that she's depicted him as, as as what she likes about him and what she thinks men should be like do you think there are certain members of this group matt that are more dangerous than others because i think that there's another really interesting thing and it's quite sparing in the writing right but i think you get an idea that like the woman that was in prison for example she's clearly like unhinged and is out and out maybe the most violent and dangerous on the surface but actually part of me thought do you even have this ideology that some of the others do like she kind of talks about i just like to be told what to do i just like someone to follow right and i think she represents a certain group of people in the world probably that will just go with the pack mentality almost right like it feels like i don't know i had i sprung to mind some of those like idiots in the insurrection in on january the 6th right that just like went along with whatever and did whatever just like to cause chaos almost right and then you have the other people that were more like the brains behind it but it seemed like she was something different to some of the others that had maybe something slightly more insidious going on do you know what i mean and as to who's the most scary like leslie's terrifying but but there's that one scene where they face off right before leslie smothers the girl yeah um, where I wasn't sure who I was more scared of because the 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 crying manipulation in Emily to get Leslie mm. to do the murder mm-hmm. and, and the sheer violence and and you know intensity of Leslie it, it was I was my favorite film uh, my favorite scene in, in in the film and my favorite moment that that little face off that they have. Um, where they're both utterly terrifying, I thought. The performances are astonishing, I think, aren't they? Like, yeah. again, I, I, I can't imagine what it was like for them on set, like what headspace they must have been mm. in. So apparently they filmed it four times, four consecutive nights. Uh, I think that it was the fourth night that is the take that we that we saw. They deliberately start filming at about 6 o'clock p.m. so that you get daylight in the first half and then it's nighttime by the time you get to the second half. So they kind of timed it around when dusk was. All of that is kind of so clever, but they they must just be like emotionally exhausted, I imagine, right? By the time you yeah. get to the end of it, it's yeah. really, really crazy. And, you know, like, how do you find just like to come away from this film for a second? Like, how do you find the kind of single take gimmick usually? Like you had ones recently, like films like Victoria and also Boiling Point that were kind of genuine single take movies. Do you think it's like a a, a device that is effective for you? I think it works quite well, to be honest. Mm. Whenever I hear that a film is going to be in one take, you kind of, you know that everything's going to have to wrap up in that time. Yeah. And it's going to have to be pacey because if you're walking around for ages with one character, not saying much, not doing much, then you're you're going to lose all sort of pace. And because you can't cut, so it's all... Because every time you take a cut, you kind of have a breather, don't you? And then you know something else is going to come. You can set up a scene. You can do all of this stuff. Yeah. But when it is one take and it is all just carrying on and all happening at once i feel like you're more in it Mm. but yeah i think that's that for me personally i don't really have an issue with it other than it must be really fucking hard to do i think that's the only thing about it for me is that like sometimes it takes me out of the film because i'm thinking about how they achieve stuff like (laughs) i'm thinking more about the logistics of it than i am immersed in the story so sometimes i think it has the opposite effect for me because i think most of the time single takes are designed to immerse you but i think sometimes that it runs the risk for me of feeling a bit showy like showing off almost to the point where it takes me out of the film i actually didn't think that with soft and quiet like i almost forget 
the single take element of it but i think at their worst they can be like that um matt how do you feel about i like the showiness of it it does Mm. it does take me out of it yeah um, because you're thinking about it but i like the showiness of it i like how showy it is and i like how impressive it is i don't think i've ever seen a single take film that i didn't like um because I, i i just didn't really enjoy it it is very obviously a gimmick i mean you know you can use it in interesting ways and i think that they are using it in quite an interesting way that I hadn't really seen before in Soft and Quiet. But ultimately it is a gimmick, um, but it's one that I really, really do like. Um, and I'm always happy to see a, a one-shot film. And I think it just makes everything feel so much more relentless in this film. Um, so I think we need to talk about the home invasion sequence, right? Which we see play out in real time. After this altercation with these two Asian women in the convenience store, they decide that they're going to raid their home and fuck with it, basically, right? So we we join these white women, these white supremacists, as they drive up to this affluent home, which they're annoyed about, right? That it's an affluent home. They go in, they start messing with stuff, they find their passport and they're going to take it and all of this. And then, of course, the women arrive home earlier than expected and things escalate, things get violent. They basically start tormenting these women, torturing them, brutalizing them. And then, of course, one of them accidentally ends up getting killed and the panic sets in. Um, It's And I think because we're just watching it all happen and escalate in real time and we watch that woman just die in real time, there's something just so harrowing about it james how did you find this home invasion sequence it's just the nerves you have when you're watching that entire sequence even from just when she steps in the door and then she steps back out and then is coming back in and then yeah as soon as they are on those chairs and you hear the plan that they're going to do we're just going to scare them you know some shit's going to hit the fan it's all going to go belly up and it's just all of those moments and because they're they're pretending to have so much fun. I mean, they probably are because these characters are trying to have fun with it, like putting the mayonnaise in her hair. Oh, yeah. And then just the way it escalates. I don't know how they think that just doing this is ever going to be a good idea. Yes. Like They're such is... fucking idiots, right? Aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Like This is the thing I kept thinking to myself. Like They are idiots, these women. Well, they're not just know? idiots. They're, they're extremely entitled, aren't they? They don't presume that anything bad can or will happen to them yes uh, and they believe they are entitled to do whatever they want to these women how did you find it matt like is this too much do you think that th- this sequence like because i think this is the point where and i've re- people commented on social media to, you know when i said i was watching this to say like th- they st- had to stop watching it people walked out you know like how, how did you find it um i think it's it's an extremely unpleasant scene i, I couldn't make my mind up there's um the there's there's two moments where uh leslie is uh doing what she does and um the it the the action is is held off screen yes and i couldn't make my mind up if that was like a if i was glad for that or if it was worse yeah to be to be just out of shot especially um kim kim watching and, and realizing in horror mm-hmm. what's going on uh, and the camera holds on her reaction to it I found that really unsettling. Yeah. Um, and also just like leaving it to your imagination of, of what's going on just out of frame is yes. is unpleasant in its own way as well. So pretty horrible, pretty it's horrible all around. fucking horrible. But I, I, was, I was grateful it was just that one scene. And I do think that in terms of direction, the execution w- was good. Like placement in the in the chronology of the film, um, it was really well placed to, to have its impact. And the lead up to it as well, that moment where the sound completely goes is really builds up that tension because you've had one death already and you know that there's more stuff to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I was, I I had to check my TV to see if the, the sound had had an issue just in case, because I didn't want, I'm like, I was so in the moment of it, but it's just all of that lead up. And I think you're right, Matt. It's, it's even more disturbing. The fact, you know, it's happening in the background of the shot and it's because it's just, just below i think because they don't they don't go to a different room they don't show you different characters and you you are there in the room and you're seeing their reaction and that makes it so much more visceral 
and disturbing. And again, you're, you're complicit. Yeah, you're complicit. In I it. think that's what it is. It's just you just want to be out of there. Like you, and then this is why people have you know said that they 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 had to physically like get out of the room when they were watching it. And I, you can feel that. Like you can absolutely feel that. And I think there's something. It, I don't know, it kind of feels like every time it's got as bad as it can get, it gets worse as well. Like when suddenly Leslie says, we need to make it look like a rape so that they don't think it's women. And then suddenly That's in this it. movie that is basically entirely about women, you think maybe the one thing that it won't feature is sexual violence. And then you get this horrific sexual violence happen as well. Again, like just off screen, but it is all in there. It basically gives you every horrific act imaginable within that one real-time scene, doesn't it? You know, and it's really, it's a lot. Stop <laughs> moving! Stop it! Don't, Don't leave that! Marjorie! I feel like you're not yes, What are you doing? doing? And I get that this is not a film for everyone. I get that for some people it's going to be too uncomfortable to watch, it's going to be too horrific to sit through, but I do feel like the, the violence uh, is in here for a reason, right? I feel like this this filmmaker, this storyteller has something that she wants to say and she's saying it, you know? And there is something really powerful about that. And I'm <clears throat> I'm not likely to want to go and pop this on again and, and watch it for fun, but I'm really glad this film exists, you know? And I, I'm kind of glad that people out there on TikTok were watching it and talking about it as well, because I, I do genuinely think this is going to be a movie maybe in decades time we're going to look back on as a very interesting snapshot of this very dark era in our history. You yeah, know? I would agree with that 100%, because I think it's almost unfair the way people have compared this to some more grotesque films and been like, it's really scary and this is what it is. This is... It's terrifying, this film, but it's also important social commentary. And I've seen some reviewers say it's a bit too on the nose, but I mean, stuff like this is happening. So you've got to you've got to tell that story. Yeah. And like if you put it in people's faces on a big screen, that's how you get the message across and just get them to look at themselves and what's actually happening. Yeah and hopefully change some of this fear-mongering. I always remember this quote from Spike Lee when he talked about Black Klansmen. And, you know, Black Klansmen, you know, obviously, like, very, like, not subtle in its messaging. And, and it even ends with, you know, not to spoil it, but it ends with a montage of what happened in Charlottesville and, and footage of Donald Trump, right, at the end of this fictional film. And people accuse that of being on the nose. But Spike Lee was like, this is a moment not to be subtle like we're done with subtlety like you you can't subtly weave a message like this in you have to scream it in people's faces because it's it's like a real danger and like i think that's what this movie is isn't it it's like a scream in everyone's face um just one that is called soft and quiet as well ironically but it gets like it gets so the sound design gets unbelievable as well doesn't it in that home invasion scene just like the the cacophony of sounds um and then it does get a bit kind of chaotic after that and and it has a kind of weird ending doesn't it like it doesn't really give you a lot of resolution or satisfaction how did you find matt the way in which the action then finally concludes with them like going out on this boat and and the way that the movie kind of ends there i think it's like v visually not very good yes because it, it is like a very like it's a well-directed film until that final sequence it, it basically just becomes incredibly visually dark yes and I, I actually just found myself just switching off a little bit because um it felt like a foregone conclusion in terms of plot because it's a single take movie and um, there's only so much time left in the film and they're, they're going to a place they're either going to get caught or not um but it was all just happening in the dark and I, I just kind of like lost it a bit um in terms of like the very end I I felt like it was actually a little bit of a cop-out um that it's quite a nasty film. It's a very nasty story. And then there's like this twist at the end where where um, one of the girls su has actually survived. Yeah. Implying that, you know, maybe, probably these women will be brought to justice. But that actually just felt like a cop out because it's a very intense, realistic and believable film. And I don't really think that girl would have floated to the surface there and been all right and been able to get out mm. so i felt that like that was a bit of a cop out and and then a bit of a disappointing kind of final act in the dark where i just didn't really know what was going on yeah i wondered about that too like i don't know but i what because this is another blumhouse film um and i don't know whether maybe there was any pressure on on the film to give it that 
ending. It almost feels like a studio note or something to have her suddenly burst out of the water like that at the end. But I don't know. Yeah, James, how did you find the ending? I am on the other side of the fence on Mm. this one. I think it's important the way it ends. Mm -hmm. And all of that lead up in the last scene, like there's the moment where you're looking at that bag in the back of the car and you're constantly just praying that it's going to move. Yeah. And you're really, you've like, you're hoping that she's going to survive. And I think it's just, there's so much tension and so much dread in this and so much focus on these horrendous people that can do whatever they want. I think it's important that at the end, there's a, a little glimpse of hope that maybe they like, they're not going to get away with what they've done. Yeah. I think I needed that after all this intensity and just that kind of like I can I can take a breath at the end. Well, that's it. There is something literally. She comes out and takes this breath, doesn't she? And it like bursts us out of the moment for a second. Um, yeah, I sort of get both perspectives on that definitely. Um, and I did keep assuming to myself, like I did keep thinking, surely in the world of this film they are going to get caught, right? Because they've been so stupid at every stage of this. And 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 actually, even if that woman hadn't survived i kept thinking surely they will get caught right but who knows that's just open to interpretation yeah. um, they do a horrible job of cleaning up yeah the, when she's scooping <laughs> up the mayonnaise that was like i thought that was quite a satisfying moment because you could sort of see it in her face that like she knew mm. she was not doing a good enough job of cleaning up and things yeah. were things were falling apart around her that for me was the justice like that i thought that emily knew that she was not getting away with th- with this um that i didn't need the kind of the twist at the end not that i wanted that woman to die or whatever but you know i just it it felt unrealistic do you think as well like one more question about this <laughs> this is and i'm aware that we're like three blokes three white blokes talking about this but do you think matt there is a reason as to why this film particularly is is about women uh you know like as opposed to a whole bunch of racist blokes going off and doing this home invasion like does it change the film in some way yeah i think it, it's 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 got to be women for the message of, of soft and quiet. And that's right. very explicit. And Emily explains the, um, explains their, their methodology and that that's what the director is interested in. And it's, it's that behavior that, that she's trying to explore in this. And I do think that writing Craig, the way he's written and having the, the pastor pass pastor, mm. um, as someone who we barely see, like he, he has lines but his face is sort of like half turned away yeah. as if he doesn't want to be filmed. Yeah. Um, you know, the, he's a he's made a more minor character than he even is. Mm. And Craig is minimized for f- deliberately, I think, for the same reason as well, to explore this idea of soft and quiet power in, in the in the white supremacist movement. Yeah, if there are a bunch of skinheads with Nazi symbols on top of their foreheads or whatever, then you would yeah know what you're getting but i think the idea and the message is that people have these these thoughts and they are perpetuating these sinister agendas and they could be anyone and they could be a group of teachers and soccer mums and just having a meeting about these things that they all believe and then patting themselves on the back because they're doing what they think is is the the thing to do and just having no concept of the world around them and sort of the impact of these these dark racist thoughts that they've got and it just makes it so much more realistic as well because it could be someone that you've met some acquaintance has these dark racist thoughts and that makes it so much more horrifying because it's the proofs in the pudding in america yeah You've got these people coming into big positions of power that are openly saying these really racist things. Mm -hmm. And that's the danger, isn't it? Just not being awake to to the to the agenda of it really. Yeah, exactly. Everything is kind of hiding in plain sight in that regard. Yeah. Oh, heavy stuff. (laughs) Heavy stuff. (laughs) Um it's a hard movie to sort of recommend, isn't it? But, do, you know, like, do you think, Matt, is this a film that you would ever, A, watch again, or B, recommend to anyone, do you think? Um, I watched it a couple of times for this, um, and I do, I do think I would watch it again. I thought I maybe wouldn't have said that the first time I watched it, but then I decided to just watch it once more for, for, the, record, for the record tonight. Um, and I think that it's very powerful, 
and very well directed and I do really like it. I think I would watch it again. Um, I, and I would also recommend it, but to a, to a to specific select people. audience of friends <laughs> with, with serious caveats and... I did tell you not to watch this one with your wife uh, when I messaged you about it. it, As if I'd watch any of the films for this show with my wife. (laughs) I know. I had to do the same. I was like, to said to my wife, I was like, are you, when are you going out? And she was like, why? I was like, like, I've got to watch this film and you're not going to want to be in the room when I watch it. Um, (laughs) um, James, what about you? Is this a movie that you'd, you'd revisit or recommend to people, do you think? I would probably recommend it to people. If I knew, like you said, Matt, if I knew they were a certain kind of film watcher and they'd appreciate it in the Mm. same way. I think also, I think a good way to go in is not knowing too much about it. Yeah. I think there's that element of of shock, right? When you first Mm. watch it. Yeah. Just just like you said to to me and Matt before today's episode, it's it's disturbing and you didn't say much more than that. Yeah. You said it's it's quite an intense watch, and I think that is a is a good way to go into it because you're along for the ride, and your eyes are open the entire time. Oh, well, there you go. That is it. Uh, oh, we can take a big a breath, breath, like at the end of that movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> this has been lovely, horrible, but lovely. lovely. Thank you, guys. Um, tell me uh, my my final question for you. You may not be the biggest Home Invasion fans, right? But do you have a favourite of this subgenre? Matt, do you have a favourite Home Invasion movie? Um, I mean, I love uh, I love A Clockwork Orange, um, mm. which we, we, we covered as a, as a dystopian film. Um, yeah, and, and which we covered this series in Home Invasion yeah. as well, actually. There's a lot of crossover yeah. with the dystopian movies. Yeah, yeah. people invade <laughs> homes in dystopias. Um, I love that film. Um, I, really, uh, I really like Rear Window as well, but... But, be, but being honest with you, this is not a genre that I seek out in my free time no. because because I, I do find it too affecting. Yeah. Come back next series, we'll do something much lighter, I promise. Yeah. It's going to be like you guys with Space Opera. I'm gonna <laughs> yeah, find you'll need it. Mate. I'm going to yeah. find something nice to do next Alec year. Alec Lenter. Exactly. Uh, James, what about you? Do you have a favourite home invasion? Uh, I think A Clockwork Orange yeah. is definitely my favourite. I've got a couple of rogue selections. Oh, go on. Um... Coraline, I would say. Yeah, that's good. I think that's a really good one. Also, being John Malkovich in a way mm. is a kind of a home invasion. <gasps> Love that. A kind of like because, your mind invasion kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. mind invasion. It might be the wrong genre for it, but yeah, I would say those two. But that's me sort of sci-fi adjacent almost trying to get in there fantasy adjacent but yeah love that excellent choices uh i was tempted to cover Car- uh, Coraline at one point but then i got such like uproar about co- covering home alone that i was like maybe i'll, I'll steer away from the kids movies <laughs> home alone bit. i'd throw in as a favorite then. right yeah. i mean like yeah that's a, that's a big deal of a home invasion movie uh amazing guys thank you so much for this um and for taking one for the team to discuss that particular movie as well <laughs> uh really appreciate it and um just remind people if they want to come and find journey through sci-fi and the new episodes you've got coming up where can they find you you can find us all over social media we are on at through sci-fi or at through sci-fi pod you can come and chat to us there we've also got a website which is journey through sci-fi.com and the podcast is all over the streaming sites all over the internet you'll be able to find us there and if you like what we do you can come over and join us on patreon.com slash journey through sci-fi and get all our bonus content there and support what we do Amazing. Guys, thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to this week's brilliant guests, Matt and James from Journey Through Sci-Fi. Uh, that was not an easy pair of films to discuss in a lot of ways, um, but I would love to hear your thoughts on these movies and this discussion. Please do get in touch. You can email me evolutionofhorror at gmail.com and you can also find us on all the socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, Blue Sky, X, you know, whatever, threads, all that shit. Um, and if you want to discuss this week's episode with fellow listeners you can also join the evolution of horror discord or the evolution of horror discussion group which can be found on facebook if you want to listen to weekly bonus episodes then sign up to our patreon channel patreon.com slash evolution of horror we've got so much exciting stuff coming through the month of october so many new releases to cover including a new saw movie a new exorcist movie a new mike flanagan tv show a new pet cemetery movie 
Party and many, many other things coming up in the next month on Patreon, patreon.com slash evolution of horror. You can find this podcast in all the usual podcast platforms. And if you get a spare moment, I'd be so grateful if you could drop us a little rating and review on Apple Podcasts, as that really helps us get discovered by new listeners. So on to next week then, and we've got two more quite interesting looks at America through the lens of home invasion, this time specifically one particular part of America. Next week, it's a double bill of movies about LA and Hollywood. Next week, I'm going to be joined by a brand new guest, the brilliant Christina Newland, and we're going to be talking about Nightcrawler from 2014 and Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood from 2019. Join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. 